Hey, futurists. If you enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. The past. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The present. What's the world coming to? Hence. The future. Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Moore Cronin. Today we're discussing the future of vision. With us today is Dr. Martin Mullen. Martin is a physician and eye surgeon. He's currently doing his residency in ophthalmology at the University of Texas. And you may remember him from an earlier episode of Hence the Future called The Future of Health and Mortality. Martin, it's great to have you back on the podcast. Thanks for having me back. Awesome. So today, in the first half of this episode, I want to talk about vision in general and the field of ophthalmology and everything going on in that realm. And then in the second half, I want to talk about how our vision can actually be augmented using technology like smart glasses, smart contact lenses, and that sort of thing. So to start out, I think it would be good to talk about what the purpose of our eyes really are, really is, and how our eyes have evolved over time. And, you know, just looking at a little bit of research of what's been found, you know, some very early organisms, they just would have... A little sensor for light so that if there was food nearby they would swim towards the light and that would more often than not lead them to food so really that was sort of the ultimate original purpose of our eyes is finding food and then over time it evolved so that it actually allowed for a better way to focus like different distances and that's sort of what the lens does and different shapes of eyes like snails have eyes that go you know far out of their heads so they can kind of see in all directions and that's kind of why our eyes sort of bulge out but there's a lot of trade-offs with different eye types like for instance we are able to have good depth perception because we have our eyes here and we can sort of create this world but we're a little bit um you know that if someone sneaks up from behind then we'd be in a lot worse position than say a horse which has, you know, eyes on each of its sides. So it's really good at detecting predators, but it's not that good at at perceiving depth because it doesn't have that combined viewing. So it's interesting just to think about like, there are so many different types of eyes out there and the human eye is really just one iteration of that. And there's no reason to think that it's the, you know, the best possible type of eye. And obviously, there are also some downsides to human eyes. I mean, just looking at the most common eye diseases that humans have, um, you know, the most common one is myopia, and then cataract related issues, uh, hyperopia, um, you know, a blindness is another not not as common and then, you know, age related macular degeneration. So I'm curious, from your perspective, what are the most common issues with the eye and are there any hopes of, of improving upon, you know, those issues as we age? Yeah, you mentioned a uh, few of the major uh, diseases that uh, we take care of as ophthalmologists, um, macular degeneration being a big one, like you mentioned, glaucoma is another big right. one. Um, I think the current estimate is that it's like 3 million people have glaucoma in the U.S., and what um, is what is that exactly? It's uh well it's interesting it's there's a lot of different types of glaucoma essentially it's a disease of the optic nerve um, hmm. usually related to high pressure in the eye but uh, we still do not really understand what causes it. You know right. there's a lot of uh, you know genetic factors it tends to run in families. Um, and why would uh, there be pressure in the eye? Is that related to like going on airplanes a lot or is it just something that is about your specific body? There's just a normal pressure that your eye has to maintain in order to maintain its shape. Hmm. So typically it's, you know, the average pressure in the eye is somewhere in the range between 11 and 22 uh, millimeters of mercury. And uh, we know that people who have higher pressure, higher than 22 uh, often are at higher risk of developing glaucoma. And that's the main treatment is to, to lower the pressure through drops or surgery or lasers. Um, but even still, there are people who have relatively normal pressures who develop glaucoma. Um, hmm. So there's a, there's a lot we don't really know about it. Um, we're still trying to learn a lot more, but it is like the second leading 
cause of blindness worldwide, um, second to cataracts, which we don't usually think of cataracts as being a cause of blindness because like in the U.S. where we have access to cataract surgery, nobody really goes blind from cataracts. But right. in other countries where they just don't have uh, access to ophthalmologists or cataract surgeons, uh, people will just go blind from that. Uh, you know, hmm. there was a uh, a resident at our program a couple of years ago who came back to give a talk how after he graduated residency, he went to somewhere in South Africa, a country in South Africa um, that had a population, I can't remember the country exactly, but of like several million people. And he was literally the only ophthalmologist in the entire country. Wow. And so uh, it just goes to show you that there is a huge problem worldwide for, I mean, we have a, you know, more or less a simple solution and we have a surgery to fix this. We just don't have a way to deliver it um, to people. So that's a big challenge that we're facing going uh, into the future here. Hmm. And what's that one operation where, uh, you know, I was listening to this Joe Rogan episode and they talked about how, at least in mice, they've been able to sort of reverse blindness from like injecting something into the eye or maybe it's like preventing blindness. What, what is that surgery? How does that work? Um, I, I don't know what that, what they're referring to in that one, um, in particular, but if there's a way, I mean, the goal is if you could regenerate the nerve, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that would be kind of like the Holy grail of, of cures because, and let's take glaucoma, for example, you know, it's, it's progressive damage to the nerve over time. Um, and once it's been damaged, you can't reverse that. Uh, right. so, so people slowly lose peripheral vision. You try to stop it. You try to get the pressure down. Uh, but yeah, once the damage is done, it, it's like, you know, analogous to, you know, somebody who has a spinal cord injury. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once that nerve's been cut or, you know, the or somebody who's had a stroke, you know, once the damage has been done, you can't really regenerate that uh, tissue, that those neurons. But, you know, that's the hope, maybe through stem right. cells or some other kind of gene therapy. Well, I have uh, I have heard that frogs are able to regenerate their optic nerves. And so there is some research ongoing of how we might be able to, you know, research how they do it and then apply that to humans. And that's kind of similar to, for instance, hearing loss is something that's also incurable. You know, you can't regrow your follicles, but mm -hmm. birds are able to regenerate their follicles. So yeah, it does seem like even if nature has found a way to make it work, it's not always easy to make it work for humans. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the hope is I think the future really is going to be in uh, regenerative medicine, you know, to either mm -hmm. reverse some of these causes of blindness, either in your retina or in your nerve, uh, or, uh, at least to halt, you know, the progression. Um, right. so there is a lot of, uh, research going on right now out there with, uh, with gene therapy, with regenerative medicine. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of these issues are very complex and they require people from a lot of different disciplines in order to, uh, solve these problems. But, you know, there is, there is hope, I think, uh, in the near future of, of coming up with solutions. Right. I'm also interested in age related eye maladies, you know, for instance, why is it the case that our eyes tend to get worse over time and how does LASIK fix that? And then when LASIK does fix that, why does it tend to get unfixed over time? So LASIK is really, uh, LASIK is doing like laser surgery on the front part of the eye on the cornea. Mm -hmm. And what it's doing is it's actually changing the shape of, of the front part of your eye so that when light enters your eye, it, uh, it bends in a different way so that you don't need glasses. Right. And that's what your, what your glasses are doing is they're bending light for you in a different way because your eye has a certain shape to it that you know, the image isn't focused properly. Right. So the eye basically loses, its sh loses its shape as you age. And then, so it becomes more oblong and then you like slice off. So it's a little more flat. Is that the basic idea? So like, let's say you're doing LASIK in like, you know, a young person who just has myopia or nearsightedness, you yeah. know, that their eye is just usually like a little bit longer than the average person, you know, just by right. like a few millimeters. And so what you're doing is you're changing the shape, like flattening out the cornea a little bit so that uh, the light bends and focuses on the retina without any correction, without any glasses. 
Hmm. What I think what you're referring to is like when people age and they get uh, something called presbyopia, which is, you know, people need reading glasses. They have trouble looking up close. They have trouble reading and people find that to be really annoying. Um, The reason that happens is because the lens in your eye, uh, which when you're young is able to change shape. So when you're looking off in the distance, you know, your lens might be like a little uh, flatter. And then sort of when you, you look at something up close, it sends a signal to your brain and your lens like fattens up. That's hmm. you're able to change focal lengths of what you're looking at so that things are clear at all distances. Yeah. When you age, you kind of lose that ability for your lens uh, in your eye to change shape. And that's why uh, a lot of times you might be looking off the distance. It looks fine. Then you look up close. It's really blurry. You need to put on reading glasses for that. So, yeah, that is a problem that uh, a lot like almost everybody ends up dealing with as they get older. Yeah, it does seem quite common. And I was surprised to see, you know, looking at the number of of surgeries that the most common is orthopedic, which makes sense. But the second most common is ophthalmology. And so it does seem like quite a common uh, issue that people would need solved. I guess one thing that is uh, probably just for cataract surgery you know i mean uh, cataract surgery is one of the most common surgeries done in the u.s so and that's when it gets kind of like blurry right it, and yeah you get, is that the same, the same thing where you the, get floaters or is that a different thing that's a different thing but the uh yeah the cataract is just a cloudy lens in your eye so you know when you're when you're young the lens is nice and clear and as you age it just becomes cloudy mm-hmm. i don't know for a lot of different reasons that people think of maybe UV light uh, might affect that, uh, you know, people at higher altitudes where, you know, maybe they're more exposed to more UV light, they get cataracts younger. And so uh, you're literally in this surgery, you're putting in an artificial lens in place of your artificial lens. Yeah. So you remove the natural lens of the eye uh, and then you're putting an artificial lens in. It seems like that would be a natural place to have some sort of bionic vision if you already need a cataract surgery, why not put in a lens that has some extra capabilities? Yeah. And there are a lot of companies who are uh, working on that right now, like not only with the lens itself, but just something that holds the space that surrounds the lens, surround the, that surrounds the lens in order to, you know, let's say you need like an upgrade on your lens or something, you can easily mm-hmm. then take it out if there is some kind of bionic. Yeah, you get the new version comes out in September and then, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) But I mean, if you think about it, you know, if we want some sort of like bionic vision or augmented reality vision, are most people going to want to wait until they've developed a cataract in order, you know, to Mm, do that? Glasses are probably going to be a lot easier. Like, are you going to be doing surgeries to implant these things on people with totally normal, healthy lenses? Like, I just... You know, don't right. see that, taking that kind of risk as something that's like feasible. Or yeah, most totally. To undergo, you know, no, I agree. The other thing that I, I keep thinking about related to the space is the the common idea that watching digital screens all day is bad for your eyes. And mm-hmm. I, a, I wonder how much truth there is in that. And B, I wonder if like this whole augmented vision will actually exacerbate the problem. Of, of uh, but first, I just want to ask you, is that like a real thing among ophthalmologists? Is, is digital screen consumption bad? Uh, the only thing that we know that it kind of causes problems with is dryness, because when you're looking at screens all day, you're actually blinking a lot less than you normally would. Huh. So people get uh, there's a lot more people with like dry eye problems. Why is know? that? Just because you're more engaged? I think it's because you're more engaged. I don't think they really know why. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with the specific like light like or wavelength lighter. of light. Yeah. The blue light, I think the whole thing about that is that uh, people think that it just, you know, messes up your like sleep wake cycle. Because oh, um, right. it's not natural rhythms. to have that yeah. kind of light at, you know, 11 p.m. at night. But in terms of like actually damaging your vision i don't think there's really any evidence that uh you know screens or phones or anything like that are causing any vision problems you know in that sense what about low light reading because i've heard that um you know it's bad to be reading in low light but if you have some light on in the rest of the room it's a lot better for your eyes is that the Uh, case or uh, is that an old wives tale no i don't think that's true Yeah. yeah and i don't think there's any harm to 
reading in, you know, high light or low light. I don't think it makes a difference. And I don't think there's any harm you're doing to your eyes. Right. Cool. Well, so the next thing I'm interested in is the field of ophthalmology specifically. What is, in your view, like the cutting edge of ophthalmology? Is there, are there any interesting developments being made right now? You know, whether that's using virtual reality, augmented reality, robotic surgeries, just new practices or methods. Like, is there anything interesting going on in ophthalmology right now that, that you see on the horizon? Yeah, um, a lot of different things are going on right now. Um, so, well, let's just take the uh, sort of like augmented reality space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for people who have, let's say, a, a condition like macular degeneration where they've lost parts of their vision, you know, maybe they have intact vision in their periphery, but it's like really their central vision that's because it's, there's some scarring there that they've basically lost some of those areas. So when they look straight ahead at you or try to read something, there's just spots of their vision that they can't see um, or that are very blurry. Um, mm -hmm. And so there is a company I know right now who's using sort of an augmented reality device that changes, it takes in the whole visual field and then it tracks your eye movements. It finds out where the spots are that you're having trouble seeing based on a visual field test that you take. And then it basically just projects all of like the normal visual field onto the parts of your retina that are still intact. Hmm. And so like as you read something, it might look like the letters are sort of like waving up and down or something like that. I'm not exactly sure right. what the perspective of the patient is, but they're able to take in all that information still in some way and their brain is able to still process it and they're able to see things and like read things and see people's faces uh, that they weren't able to previously do. That's interesting. It almost sounds kind of like, again, with the hearing space, it's like if you have trouble hearing certain frequencies, you can boost those specific frequencies so that you're leveraging what you still are able to hear well. And it is interesting to think that, you know, light and seeing is also dependent on wavelengths and perceiving different wavelengths. Like, I was fascinated to just, you know, see that certain animals can see UV light. They can see additional colors that we can't even comprehend. Mm -hmm. And some of them even have thermal vision. Like I was watching this one video of what a hawk sees when it's hunting or an eagle. And it can literally sense the thermal heat coming out of rodent piss. So they see this like map of like rodent piss. And so that's how, that's what they're actually doing. They're like tracking where these rodents are and they're super uh, attenuated to any sort of movements. And yeah, so it's, I mean, it's just fascinating to see like what eyes could be capable of. And it leads me to the question of what is the furthest limitations of what's possible with eyes I mean, I know so much depends on, you know, having the right brain as well. But if we were to, in the far future, have some sort of like brain machine interface, like how much could our brains really handle with like zooming in and zooming out? And I don't know. I mean, I think that obviously the current limitation, you know, without an augmented reality system is just that like you said, like we can only see in the visible spectrum of yeah. light and that's what we've evolved to. We have, you know, certain photoreceptors in the back of our eyes that see, you know, red, green, blue light, you know, light, dark conditions. And so the combination of those, you know, cones or uh, when a, what those photoreceptors is basically that's the visible spectrum we can see. But if you I mean, if you had some kind of, you know, augmented reality that could basically, you know, it could detect like thermal vision or UV vision or something and somehow like have an overlay onto, you know, uh, the front of our eye in terms of like some kind of area that we could see like that. Like it's not, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that we could walk around with glasses that could be showing us those things if, you know, that's something that, you know, people wanted to do. Yeah. Well, there already are some interesting examples like and this sort of gets into the smart glasses world. But for instance, Huawei, you know, the Chinese phone manufacturer, that's the second biggest. It goes Samsung, Huawei, Apple. And they have a phone that can zoom in 50x. So basically you can like have your phone 
on the 30th floor of some hotel room and you can zoom in on people playing go like you know really far away and actually see like the moves they're making on the board and it's it's pretty incredible and they're also next month or in like you know 15 days they're going to release their first ever smart glasses which they're calling gentle monster Mm -hmm. and it people think that this will likely have the same sort of zoom capabilities and it's just an incredible to think like if you had these glasses that had that sort of camera capability where you could zoom in and see things super far away. And then I saw another demo where you can actually zoom in on like your actual skin and see like almost at the cellular level. It yeah. would just be incredible to have that. I mean, the limitation is not, you know, like I was saying, like not our brain or our eye. It's more so like the device, like what's the technology in that device if it can zoom 50 you know 50 yards or whatever 50x, away 50x what we can 50x see. away yeah. then uh yeah i mean that's pretty amazing and it also brings up i guess a lot of privacy issues with right uh, yeah who owns like, that who's like yeah. people can literally see what you see as you go about your life that's like yeah. some of the most personal data possible and then I if mean, you I talk th- about having it actually surgically in your cataract you know yeah. there's no turning that off right and I think that like even the old Google Glass, which I don't really know that much about, there were so many privacy concerns about that. I mean, it had a way to basically pick up like the way that your finger tracked over its phone. You know, if you're looking at somebody like 15 feet away, yeah. it could like get your password from that. Right. Well, I think, you know, part of what made Google Glass seem so creepy is that by law, you have to have some sort of indicator that you're filming someone. So there would be this red light that comes on whenever you're actually using it. So you're in like the supermarket and you see some like millennial kid like looking at you, filming you with a red light. And he's got this sort of like cyborg glasses style. Mm -hmm. That's obviously a little bit uh, unnerving for the person being filmed. But Snapchat Spectacles definitely made a big improvement there where, first of all, they don't look like nerdy cyborg glasses. They actually look like glasses you would want to wear. And rather than having it be like a menacing red light, it's like this friendly white circular light that sort of flashes up in a design. Mm. Um, so, yeah, but, but, you know, they haven't def- they haven't solved things either. I mean, when they came out with the first snapchat spectacles there was so much hype around it but then they ended up having many snapchat spectacles go unsold so they took a loss there and they also found that after about a month most people had stopped using it so it makes me wonder what would need to happen for this to actually be something you would want to use in your daily life like for you what would what would the level of technology have to be for you to actually get up in the morning, put on your glasses and either go to work on the weekday or, you know, hang out on the weekend? Mm. I mean, I also think that, I mean, are you saying that you think that it wasn't as popular popular because just of the look of the glasses, like people just don't like wearing glasses? Well, I think that's why Google Glass failed partially. I'm saying, but with Snapchat Spectacles, they had great design aesthetics. I don't think that's the reason they failed. I think it's more about just the seamlessness of the technology and Mm. it not being as useful as the hassle that it entails. So I'm wondering what level of usefulness would be needed for the, you know, extra hassle of having a little bit more weight, you know, wearing glasses, if you're not used to wearing glasses, like what sort of usefulness would we need to have for you personally to want to wear these things on a daily basis. Yeah. Like, is there any way it could help your work maybe? Yeah. I mean, I could think of like a million different ways it could help a lot of people's work. I mean, if you just, if you're doing anything in like manufacturing or like in surgery and you're able to wear something that you had, you know, hands free. Um, and then it was also like giving you some kind of information, some kind of feedback information there already is in ophthalmology, this sort of, I guess that you could call it like an augmented reality display um, that for doing cataract surgery, it is like a digital overlay 
And a lot of times you have to, for certain kinds of lenses, lens implants that you're putting in people's eyes, especially for people with uh, astigmatism, which is like mm. a misshapen eye, sort of your eyes shaped a little bit more like a, like a football rather than a basketball or, you know, mm. that kind of curve to it. Uh, so you can put lens implants when you do cataract surgery to correct for that, but you have to align it in a certain way, like a certain axis. And there is uh, uh, this like augmented overlay that gives you like a whole 360 like axis thing and tells you that you're lined up properly. Wow. Um, and so that's like one way that it's being used in ophthalmology. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I think that there is also going to be right now we're looking under microscopes, you know, while we're doing surgery. They talk a lot about this sort of like heads up display where you're wearing more of like a VR based kind of thing. Right. So you don't have to creak uh, your neck. So you know, and, exactly. And so yeah. that way you can just sort of, be, there's something, there's some device that's looking at the eye, but then you're just have like a VR kind of thing looking through that right. or an augmented reality thing like that. Huh. And you're like, as if you're looking at a screen and then that's, you're operating down. That's interesting. It actually reminds me of this military goggles technology that came out recently where basically you have your scope on your gun and then you have night vision, like thermal high tech goggles and the goggles actually see what is what your scope sees rather than what your eyes see. So it mm -hmm. allows soldiers to basically put their gun around a corner and see if there's an enemy there and literally fire without having any risk of exposing your head to the enemy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, I could see that being really useful for surgeries, too where it's mm -hmm. like you're seeing what your instrument sees because that's really the most important viewpoint. But what I would find like really annoying is if you could think of a future where you wake up and put your, your Google glass or whatever, your glasses on with augmented reality. You're just like continuously, it's just like a overlay of your phone. You know, you're right. getting notifications, uh, you know, things are popping up. Like we're already so immersed in our phones. It's like, that's just taking it to the next level. Oh yeah. And like, I don't know if that would necessarily be good for people or if most people would actually want that. Right. Well, it reminds me of this quote that says a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. And that's so true. It's like the more information overload, the less attention you can put on any one task. And I think this really gets at what are the different philosophies of smart glasses companies. And, you know, we talked about Snapchat is really social focused. It's ma really made for someone who's like a vlogger, like an influencer, just capturing things in your daily life. Uh, Microsoft HoloLens, they're all based on catering to industry professionals. So people like, you know, medical professionals, also people like architects. So you can see the model that you're working on. And so they've sort of taken that industry approach. There's also Amazon has backed a company called North, which has a product called Focals. And this you can actually buy today for 600 bucks. And they are basically using their focus is how can you use Alexa as you normally would, but with some sort of visual component. So it's, mm. you know, any normal thing like ordering an Uber and that kind of stuff, pretty much what you would expect. But then there's uh, an interesting thing is Intel Vaunt. They are super focused on being minimalist and they're very cognizant of exactly what you said, where we don't want too many distractions. There's already enough distractions with phone notifications. So they have a very subtle minimalist approach where they only give you the most necessary notifications like you know, if you're getting need directions to go somewhere or if you have like a really important message or something like that. And they actually beam it directly to your uh, the back of your retina rather mm -hmm. than having it like displayed on the screen, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. Um, we are. And then we also talked about, you know, Huawei Gentle Monster, which is very fashion focused. It has incredible zoom capabilities. And it's really meant for everyday use. And of course, you know, Huawei would love to just, you know, vacuum up as much data as possible. Mm -hmm. It's probably a big reason they're going after it. And Google is working on uh, smart contact lenses yeah. as well. They have like a, a smaller company, a subsidiary of Google. I think it's called like Verily or something. 
I know they were working on these smart contact lenses originally to, uh, or one of their goals was to detect like your glucose levels for people who are diabetics instead of having to oh, like interesting. prick your finger every time and test your blood for your blood sugar. It could maybe just pick it up. Yeah. Your well, that's, uh, that, that's, an that's an interesting, or not, but. that's an interesting trend though. Cause I've heard a lot of people talk about that, about how it's ridiculous that the way we get medical data now is your once a year checkup because uh -huh. there are so many factors that could come into play like what you ate right before your checkup what your stress level was like if something really bad happened the day before and what would be a much better system is if we had continuous data monitorization like if you wear an apple watch every day and you can get a baseline for what your normal heart rate is that's mm -hmm. way more helpful than just measuring your heart rate once a year at the doctor's exactly. office. Same with exactly. all your other indicators. Do you think yeah. that would also be helpful with for ophthalmologists like tracking vision? And if so, how would that continuous data monitorization work? Well, yeah, I mean, another going back to glaucoma, another huge problem is the same exactly what you're talking about. Like you come in for a visit and we check the pressure in your eye. That's only what it is right at that point, you know, that exact time right. that day. Like maybe you smoked weed decisions. right before and then you have like <laughs> less so pressure, you know, it's nice and low, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so there are uh, devices that people have been trying to do uh, to invent that could continuously monitor your pressure. Hmm. Uh, and so that you could get it like an, a whole that might stream directly to your smartphone. And then you could come into your visit and you could look at like the entire trend of your pressures over the last three months. Like what's the average, you know, what's, right. what's the high, what's the low, you know, all that kind of stuff. Does it fluctuate throughout the day? And I mean that alone, just having that amount of data might give us more insight into how to better treat uh, someone's pressure um, and treat yeah. block. So there are devices that people are trying to invent and that are on the horizon of maybe being able to do that. Yeah. Another thing I wonder about there is if there could be any downsides to having like a Bluetooth signal emanating from your eyeballs, like if that could lead to cancer or some other issues with like, mm -hmm. you know, cell radiation or, you know, just anything jumbling up things on the quantum level that close to your brain, if yeah. that might have issues. What, do you, does that concern you at all? Or I guess we just don't know because we don't have the data. I don't think we really know. I mean, yeah. I, who knows what like all this, you know, what Wi-Fi and, and all the cell phones and Bluetooth and all this stuff. I mean, it seems like it's not causing any problems, but it's only this technology has only been around for a little while. And now it's like way more ubiquitous. It's everywhere we go. Right. Um, like who knows if in like 30, 40 years, you know, we find something else that it yeah. wasn't healthy for our brains in some Especially way. Especially when know. we have like 6G, 7G, 8G, yeah. and there's like, that much more intensity in the signals. Right. But the one thing that, I mean, the biggest risk of any kind of device that you're going to use, you know, if you're going to put a contact lens on or some other kind of device is always like, it's not naturally supposed to be there. So there's right. always a risk could it's reject gonna, it. or cause infection, uh -huh. you know, something like that. Even, you know, with cataract surgery, the initial surgery, there's, there's a, a low risk, but a chance of infection, you know, once, you know, that, time frame has passed like a, a couple of weeks and you're all healed up, you know, you're not going to develop an infection after that. But, uh, yeah, like a contact lens, if you're wearing it every day, you know, and people don't have good hygiene about it, or there's some device that you had to implant on the surface of your eye to detect the pressure. I mean, there's always risk that that's going to cause issues. Right you know. now. And why, you know, I don't wear contact lenses, but I've heard people say that it's really bad if you fall asleep with them. Why is that bad? Because that, that might point to limit, limitations of like smart contact lenses in the future. Well, one is that and even the best contact lenses that uh, uh, are made of a material in which oxygen can diffuse, you know, pretty well. It's just not as good as your normal cornea being exposed to the mm. to the to the air. You know, there needs to be some oxygen that your eye needs to get. Right. So that's a problem. And then, you know, it can always just trap 
bacteria underneath it, mm. especially if you don't have good hygiene with it. And if you're not changing it out and cleaning it regularly, you fall asleep in it. Uh, you know, there's a high chance that that can cause an infection on the surface right. of your eye. So. And isn't it true that sometimes people will like, if they fall asleep, it'll actually like go to the back of their eye and then they can't get it out. <laughs> it's not going to go to the, it's not, some people think that it'll like go into your brain or something, yeah. but no, no, it can't. <laughs> anatomically it, it, it can't do that okay good <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then the other two you know so you mentioned google but there's also apple so apple and google are the two big players that i'm really watching google especially they were the first people to the stage with google glass and it seems like they've learned a lot from that experience so i'm really fascinated to see what their next go-to-market product looks like and then apple I'm the most excited about Apple because it just seems like they will strike the best balance between minimalism and usefulness, like especially because Apple products have really good Bluetooth connectivity. I mean, AirPods with an iPhone, no other Bluetooth device compares with just how seamlessly you can connect it. And so I'm really curious about like how that evolves because a lot of futurists have said that you know, the iPhone 20 is not going to be an iPhone. It's going to mm -hmm. be a combination of wearables. So it'll be something like an Apple Watch, some AirPods, and some sort of glasses. Or maybe the glasses and AirPods are one component, and there's actually been a patent that Apple filed for that. Mm -hmm. um, what would you most like to see an Apple glasses product look like? Or would you be interested at all, or, or, just, or, or no? Well... I mean, I think if they could, I don't even know if it's possible. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not an engineer. I, I don't really know what the limitations are for uh, getting all of that kind of technology into a contact. But I do think that would be so nice to, if you were to find a design and the ability to compress all of that technology into a contact lens, that yeah. would be something that'd be really cool and to be able to wear that around. But then the question is like, you know, it, like the same thing that we're talking about, like the maintenance of that right. lens. Like, are you going to be washing it out every day? Like, is see, it going to be a what, pain? Yeah. See, that's why I'm actually more excited for glasses than contacts. Because as someone mm. who doesn't wear contacts myself, it would be a big change in my life to start putting things in my eyes every day. But True. sometimes I wear blue light glasses. So that would be fairly reasonable. And I guess for me, I'm less excited about knowing that someone sent me a text message or that someone mentioned me on Twitter. Like, I don't really give a shit about those notifications. What's really compelling to me is the idea that you can go beyond your current eyes limitations, like seeing super far, seeing super close up. Um, even things like if you're walking around San Francisco and you want to know like what different buildings are called or what the history of them are, or like if you go to a museum and you can see some information like, I think that's that's really compelling to me, um, more so than like just getting what you could typically get on your phone, anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then it would have to be integrated with you know some kind of AI, obviously, too, to be able to like detect what it is you're looking at, right? You know, give you information about that. Um, I mean, it could have some sort of feedback loop where if you can dismiss certain things and then not dismiss others over time, it could learn the things that you actually enjoy doing with it. Similar to how, you know, iPhone will learn the way that you talk to people on text messages based on, you know, if you don't accept their accepted edit from for sure to be two words for sure. Like I do, I usually do it as one word. So now mm -hmm. Apple just knows it never corrects my for sure's anymore. And you can see the same sort of thing where like people have different desires for what they would want to be augmented visually. Um, like I, you could basically like block out any advertisement that you don't want to see. Oh, yeah. And that's you know, like that's, a billboard, for yeah. example. Yeah. Like, and that's that the other reason nice. why I like Apple the most, because I feel the safest with Apple as the guardian of my data and the guardian of what advertisers can access my visual field and which ones can't mm -hmm. whereas i wouldn't feel the same level of comfort with like you know google or huawei or mm -hmm. some other companies yeah cool well i think 
I want to get into some predictions of how smart glasses will evolve over time. And I think the best way to do that is to get into the future scenarios. What do you think is the worst case scenario for the future of vision? Worst case scenario. Um, kind of like how we were talking before about uh, just the information overload potential of, of Google Glass or any kind of smart glass. Um, you know, just the most annoying things like social media things popping up, you know, text message just being inundated with information and uh, also the privacy concerns and sort of always mon being monitored or like things always being recorded. That's like the ultimate uh, amount of data that any of these companies could use for a lot of different purposes um, and basically like control us in sort of a, a yeah. dystopian futuristic kind of way. Yeah, it's um, like even in 1984, the screens could see you, but they couldn't, Big Brother couldn't see what you yourself were seeing. Like that's right. like another level of potential. Dystopia. Yeah, it's like it definitely another level Big Brother kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 like we're all part, the worst thing is that like we're all participating in it. People are doing it through their own volition, you know, maybe just because they're that addicted to social media, they're that addicted to technology, uh, they can't even take a step back and avoid it. And then you're you're like essentially being recorded or you know viewed without your own permission. Mm -hmm. um, that to me seems like to be a, a, a society that would be really awful to live in. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to agree with those points for me. I mean, the, the worst thing is health concerns. So if you start getting these uh, smart lenses implanted in your eye and then it has unintended consequences because it's not that tested, you know, like we've talked about with like Bluetooth signals that close to your brain, like, you know, just who who knows, especially when we get into like, you know, 5G and, and other. So that's my that's probably the worst concern I have. And then the privacy concern, I say, is the next worst concern. Like you, it's really important who is the guardian of your data. And I would be less concerned about a company like Apple guarding my data than I would about uh, Huawei or, or some other companies. So that's a big concern. And then also, yeah, I agree. There's the, the distractions, like, you know, there could be accidents. You could be reading a message and crash into someone in your car. But then there's also just how it could affect social interactions. And this to me seems like a subtle concern, but something that could really change the nature of society. Like if you're going to a dinner party and someone pretends like they're paying attention to you, but really they're like scrolling through Facebook on their smart glasses and you don't even know, or you're mm -hmm. in like a business meeting and someone is like reading their emails, like when you don't even know, it could just add another level of impersonal. Like disconnect. Cold. Yeah. People. And there's already enough of that. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm, uh, and it also could just change like our interactions. Like what if you were to meet somebody or see somebody you like, you know, uses facial recognition technology. It brings up the, all their their profile, all this data about oh, yeah. them instead yeah. of just like naturally like enjoying making the conversation. You're making a judgment, you know, about this person based on a lot of that data that you're seeing on this virtual overlay that you have in front of their face. Right. You well, totally and, change our interactions. And they are actually already using smart glasses in Chinese law enforcement that has facial recognition, that the main function that it has is when people are walking through an airport or whatever, it's taking a picture of each person's face and then giving them information. And if this person is a suspect, or even if they have like a really bad social credit score, then the police officer say. will stop them, inquire about them. And, you know, that's great if the only people that are on the list are truly bad actors. But mm -hmm. if this includes people that just, you know, protest for because they believe in freedom of thought and freedom of speech and you're basically like flagging these people and then using smart glasses to recognize them, stop them. It just it's like it's all about how it's used. Right. And so it can mm -hmm. go very badly if it's not used in the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think for the best case scenario? 
best case scenario. So for the best case scenario, I'm very optimistic about uh, a lot of the technology that's on the horizon for uh, for eye diseases and uh, vision research. Uh, I think that we're going to see more gene therapy being used for different eye diseases. There was already the first gene therapy that was approved by the FDA called Luxturna um, mm. that has been successful for a specific kind of inherited retinal disease. And not only was it, it showed that we could do gene therapy, that it did work in people, but it also demonstrated that like it's possible to, to essentially like com- manufacture this and commercialize it, you know, on a large scale level. And that there have been a lot of limitations to that in the past, but so it is kind of like a proof of concept that like we can do this for people. Could you use gene therapy to give people like eagle eye vision or <laughs> frog genes so they can regenerate I mean, their? <laughs> no, I mean, I think there is there, no, really, there are people who are doing research on like exactly like you said, there are animals that can regenerate their retina and they're trying to figure out if there is some way that we could use gene therapy to introduce that gene into into humans. Um, That's awesome. So the the problem is that that if for this you know specific one uh, for gene therapy, there's only a couple thousand people out there with this disease. And think of how long like this probably took so many years and so many millions of dollars to research to come up with this one specific thing. Now there are you know, hundreds of, of mutations out there that might need to be addressed. Right. So that that's that's the limitation. And there's so few people like if you look at this one gene therapy, it's a one time dose that people get uh, one one injection of this drug costs four hundred twenty five thousand dollars. Wow. You know, but that could potentially if that were you, I mean, that could make the difference between you being blind and, you know, being able to have some functional vision. You right. Know, it doesn't completely cure you. It does um, seem like at some point we'll crack the code where it makes financial sense to get therapy specific to your genome. Mm-hmm. Like at a certain point, you'll everyone's genome will be on file and mm-hmm. you would never get a drug that isn't specific to your genome. When do yeah. you think that'll happen? I don't know. I mean, I think that... Uh... It's going to start with, you know, some of the more common diseases first Mm -hmm. uh, and then progress to maybe some of the rarer ones. But I I do think that each one is like a different challenge. You know, we're learning more and more after we come up with a solution to each one, but each one might have a unique or somewhat unique solution. So it'll take many years of of research and a lot of money in order to come up with these therapies. So, um, yeah, but then I guess getting back to, you know, other things about the best case scenario and, and what's on the horizon, mm-hmm. uh, you know, for ophthalmology, the other thing is, you know, nanotechnology, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the drops that we have, the treatment for different diseases. I mean, they're good drugs, but they can't get to the back of the eye. Mm-hmm. And, 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 but there are people, you know, and then we have to do injections basically in the eye for the, to deliver the drug to the back of the eye. Right. especially for different kinds of macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy. So there are people researching, like, could you use nanoparticles to make a drug that you could just use a drop and it be able to get into your eye and get into the back of your eye. And mm. so that, I think, is going to happen uh, some point in the near future. The other thing is uh, tissue engineering. I mean, they're already 3D printing people's corneas. Wow. Um, and that is something I think there's a huge shortage. You know, people need cornea transplants if they've had some kind of scarring or other kind of problem with their cornea. There's about something like 10 million people who need a cornea, but you need a donor for that, you know, like any other organ. Right. Uh, so there's a limitation. But if you could actually 3D print out corneas from people, you take their own cells, culture it, build up like a scaffold, build up a cornea then you could have like unlimited, uh, you know, corneas for people to potentially transplant. So that's something that I think that will happen eventually in the future as well. That's awesome. Anything else or or do you want to hear, hear my best case? Let's hear your best case. Yeah. My best case scenario is based on the notion that technology, as it gets more and more sophisticated, it disappears. And I think that smart glasses, smart contact lenses, 
these have the potential to move us in that direction where you're not spending as much time looking at your phone, looking at screens, where what is really relevant in the digital world is merged and woven seamlessly into the real analog world. And that, I think, more than anything else, is the potential for the future of vision. And of course, if we can get beyond the limitations of the eyes as we age, as we get diseases, as you know, all of the major issues that people tend to have with their eyes, then the next step would be how do we augment it even beyond what current eyes are possible. And, you know, like I said earlier, what's most exciting to me is augmenting what like our eyes are naturally able to do. So if, for instance, and, you know, this is already possible, it just hasn't been put into like a nice looking glasses design. But if we mm-hmm. could instantly have night vision, thermal vision, zoom way in, zoom way out, Um, Mm -hmm. And then that would just be, I mean, maybe it would be like cognitive overload and you need to take a 20 minute nap afterwards, (laughs) but hopefully it it just begins to feel natural and it allows us to just go beyond our own limitations. So to me, that's the, and you know, we can then be more productive and, and all that. And, and I guess another thing I was thinking about is that when we think about the future of ophthalmology or the future of being a medical professional, the best case scenario in my view is one where you don't have to worry about paperwork. You don't have to worry about finding the patient's file, you know, looking at that information, logging things, copy and pasting things in Epic. Like if Mm -hmm. all of that stuff can just happen in the background and you have a conversation with your patient and then using voice recognition and natural language processing, if it can just automatically record what's relevant from that conversation in a database in the cloud, then you can really focus on what humans are good at, which is contextualizing the information, having the, you know, the, the human person to person connection, and then coming up with what your recommendation is, while also drawing off of the best data that is pulled up for you. And I think that could be greatly enhanced by uh, you know, next generation vision technology. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that would be a great advancement. I think it's something that's definitely needed. And one other thing I wanted to say is, uh, I, I failed to mention, uh, just the use of AI and, and, mm-hmm. and the potential that that serves for, uh, in all of healthcare, but in specifically ophthalmology, it's kind of already here right now. Um, there are some AI devices out there that can detect just incredible things. I mean, you, it can look at a picture. I, I went to a lecture uh, recently where they were talking about an AI device that can just look at a general picture of your retina and be able to tell if it was just based on all the image data that it had gathered, you know, millions of images, be able to tell if it was a male or a female eye. Wow. And there is no ophthalmologist out there who could explain how that's possible. That's because amazing. There's just nothing that we know that you can look when you look at the back of somebody's retina. There's no distinguishing factors that we're aware of yeah. that can tell if it's a male or female. But obviously, the AI is picking up on something that we don't even know. And yeah. the same way with uh, glaucoma, it is predicting glaucoma and glaucoma pro- progression on some of these systems. And we don't really even understand what it is looking at. You know, there are things that we yeah. look at on the picture, but we don't even really know what it's looking at. And it's doing it almost better than most physicians are. So, I mean, I think that's a good thing for patients, obviously, you know, and right. for people in the long run. Yeah, I mean, there's so much that the human eye misses that a machine eye will not miss. Like, mm-hmm. I saw one stat that said that radiologists have a false negative percentage of 32 percent which means Mm -hmm. basically a third of the time the radiologist will say oh yeah it looks good when really there is an issue and Mm -hmm. so it's not like machine vision recognition needs to be 100 percent it just needs to be like 67 percent to be better Mm -hmm. than the human Um, and i think with enough time and enough data there's you know with machine learning i i don't think there's any way that it won't become better than a human right um, and especially if you uh, use think, the best of both, right? And if you're using, I think it'll be like an interface where, you know, it'll take a picture of the back of your eye, look at all the with the 
OCT is a specific kind of imaging uh, technique that we have that can look at all the layers of the retina. And I think, you know, right now we just scroll through it and look at it. I think probably in the future we'll scroll through it and it'll like point to their all different tags basically like oh look at this did you look at this this could be this disease this could be something else going on did you notice this and you just kind of confirm like yes or no um, and that way you have both the human and the machine working together right. to kind of to get the best uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment for the patient yeah awesome well let's let's bring it home with the most likely scenario so what do you think is most likely Let's say in the next, you know, three to five to ten years, what do you think is going to happen? Most likely scenario. I think that all those concepts that I talked about in the uh, best case scenario will definitely happen. I think it's always difficult to predict an exact timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. You know, medicine is especially more challenging in that regard because um, there are just different barriers. You know, I mean, you're talking about humans here. So a lot of these new technologies have to be, uh, uh, you know, approved by the FDA, uh, right. you know, uh, determined that they're completely safe. Whereas, like, I think a lot of new technologies in Silicon Valley, it's like, all right, well, let's just push it out there into the market because it's just an app. I mean, what's the worst case scenario is our company fails, you know, right. we lose money. No one's going like, to die. Yeah, we'll no one's going to die. No one's going to lose their <laughs> eye, you know, so yeah. a lot of these things have to be determined to be, you have to prove that they're safe, first of all. You have to prove that they're cost effective, that actually doing them and spending healthcare dollars and taxpayer dollars on them is actually going to improve outcomes for patients. Um, and, uh, you know, so those factors, I think, make it very difficult to say, like, oh, is this going to happen in the next five years, 10 years, whatever. Right. Um, but once it's I do think that all those things that I talked about will happen at some point. It's just a matter of when. And I do think it's going to happen probably within the next, you know, 10 to 20 years, definitely within our lifetime. Um, and, you know, there's even there are even people talking about like you know, potentially being able to do something as, as radical as like transplanting an entire eye, you know, hmm. and, and, and I, I heard a lecture about this recently like and there are a lot already of report. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, obviously like this seems very science fiction, but, uh, this is how these things kind of start is like, you have to have somebody who's willing to, you know, conceptualize this, start working on the problem. And then maybe like 20 years down the line, new technologies have developed that actually allow this to be possible. Right. I um, mean, what if you had a contact lens that was like a replica of some top security cleared like defense secretary and you wear those and you can like go in? I mean, yeah, no, I mean, you could. Yeah, exactly. Because what if you're using retina You probably scans? would also need like their face as a mask because you get the face transplant along with it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, so yeah, I don't know. I just, it's really hard for me to to give you a time frame. I don't think if anybody could could predict that, obviously, uh, they 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 would be, you know, working Oracle for some VC firm and making like, yeah, exactly, <laughs> ton yeah. of money off of that. But uh, in terms of like the most likely scenario for the uh, augmented reality devices. I do think that it is inevitable that it'll just be a further invasion of our privacy. Um, I, th I might not be as bad as we made it out as in the, in the worst case scenario. I do think you hopefully have different companies competing and you might have one that's more ethical than the other. And hopefully humans will like choose to, to go with the product of that company right. and be able to recognize that. But nonetheless, I think that, you know, if we're walking around with glasses that are going to be gathering more and more data, like constantly, there's no doubt that there's potential there for, uh, for, you know, abuse, abuse of that yeah. data. Right. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I, it's hard for me to assess also how things are going to play out in the medical field because there's so many other factors like regulation and, and, and whatnot. Um, but as, as far as the augmented reality market is concerned, I think it's quite likely that both Apple and Google will come out with a mass market AR product in the next three years, uh, certainly three to five years. And you can see this just by looking at the patents they've filed, by the companies they've acquired, and you know by the fact that Apple already has AR kit 
which allows developers to build augmented reality apps on the for the iPhone or iPad. And right now, you know, you need to like hold your phone around and look like this. But mm. that same AR kit would work perfectly with augmented reality glasses. So I do think we're going to see that in the next three to five years and how much that gets adopted and what the capabilities are is still to be determined. Just looking at the numbers, the number of smart glasses that have shipped in 2017 was only 230,000. By 2022, it's projected to be 32.7 million. Mm -hmm. So it is projected to grow by quite a, quite a good percentage. And as far as what the most interested use cases are for consumers, the number one use case people wanted to see is lighting up the surroundings when it's too dark. <laughs> so it's actually not like showing notifications on screen, but it's more just augmenting your human vision so you can see at night. And mm -hmm. a lot of people, especially like, you know, women who like to jog at night, that capability would be good for their own safety. Um, and, you know, all people in, in industries, it would be helpful for them to be able to see at night. And yeah, so it's it'll be interesting to see how this plays out, like how much of it's notification based versus augmenting the biological areas of vision and also how much AI and, and machine learning play a role with identifying objects, facial recognition. I mean, it's such an mm -hmm. early field that it's good that we're reviewing this now, but I think it would be great if we reviewed this once Apple and Google launch their product like three years from now and, and see how it pans out. Yeah. And one other thing I'd just like to bring up is like the whole concept of, of like telemedicine too, you yeah. know, and that you could, I can envision a future. A lot of people are thinking about this where, uh, you know, maybe it's a little bit more difficult to get a complete eye exam done based just based on like an app on your phone. You might need like a, a device of some sort in order to like take the proper photo, like run all the scans, all that kind of stuff. But I think there will be some kind of device that maybe it's just in like your primary care doctor's office, or maybe it's in like Walgreens or something, you know, at least in the beginning before it's cheap enough for everybody. And you could just go there, like look into something. It takes a picture. It can pick mm. up on any, you know, potential disease and alert you like, Hey, you might be developing glaucoma. You should go see an ophthalmologist. Oh and, yeah. That's interesting. Uh, the reason I think that this is probably like not mobile that, automated eye exams, right? Exactly. And the reason I think that it's, it's probably not that far off into the future that this is going to be, uh, developed or this kind of device is going to be developed is because, uh, there's a company and there it's working with NASA right now to be able to do this for astronauts. Wow. Uh, because a big limitation of, of long duration space flight is that a lot of astronauts get eye problems. Um, I remember that. And they need to figure out why this is going on. I've heard it's and more often with men than women for some reason. It is reason. more often. Yeah, they don't know why. It's more hmm. often with men than women. It's something to do with being in a microgravity environment and that your optic nerve starts to swell without gravity. And a lot of these people do have a big change in their uh, the shape of their eye. They're bringing, like there are astronauts bringing up multiple pairs of glasses up into space because the longer they're in there, the more their eye changes shape and the more their glasses prescription changes. Does it go it, back to normal when they reach Earth or then they're... I actually don't is... know. I don't know about that. Oh. I, uh, there are... Uh, no, there's... In some cases, there is like permanent vision loss. Wow. So it's a major problem and probably a major barrier to us, you know, colonizing Mars unless we focus on this. So the government and NASA has put in a lot of money and a lot of resources into figuring this problem out. And in order to do that, they have to create a small device that can capture everything that we like all of our devices in ophthalmology, all of our diagnostic tools, combine it into one very small portable mm. device because they have to bring it up onto the spaceship with them. It's like the Theranos device, but for vision, if it actually worked <laughs> as advertised. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so yeah, I think like, you know, maybe in the next 10 years, there'll be something like that, that will just be everywhere and it'll be better for people's access and, and uh, uh, monitoring of different eye conditions. That's awesome. Yeah, I love when technology is widespread enough that it can help everyone, not just the early adopter techies who are willing to pay 600 bucks a pop. Right. right. Awesome. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. 
So thank you, Martin, for joining us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. This has been has the future of vision, what is currently happening, and we hope to see you next time. Will inevitably happen. The past, the present, and the future. Hey futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.